Hey, this is Digital by Computing. Today we're gonna to be talking about high availability and failover in an IT network. We're gonna talk about the good practices to put in place, the infrastructure, the setup, the configuration to put in place to ensure that your network is redundant uh, and has sufficient failover so that if devices fail, if you have a disaster, if you have backup things that you need to restore, uh, things are operational and work as expected. So we are gonna be talking about high availability and redundancy. So nowadays, businesses need to be running almost 100% of the time. Regardless of whether you're a small, medium, or large businesses, uh, most companies will need to have all of their IT operations running at least eight hours a day, sometimes 24 hours a day, seven days, 365 days a year, depending on what sort of services you are running. So making sure that you've got the right high availability and redundancy configured into all of your infrastructure is extremely important. So when you are designing your IT, you wanna make sure that all of your hardware, your configuration of your software, your servers, your, um, your systems are all configured with redundancy and high availability in mind. So essentially what we are talking about is making sure that your network, your servers, your storage, your data center, your links coming in and out, your disaster recovery, your backups are all in place to make sure that if a particular piece of hardware, if a particular software application system do go down, you do have redundancy and high availability set up in place that regardless of what goes down, another system can take away um, any of that failure and you can still, still be operational. So my general recommendation is to buy and set up everything in pairs wherever possible. If we're talking about hardware, we're talking about getting servers in pairs, not buying one server, but buying two servers, not buying one switch, but buying two switches, not buying one firewall, buying two firewalls. This can, of course, be more expensive and could lead to higher costs in the initial, um, but when you do consider that if any of these particular pieces of hardware go down, you could lose operations, you could cost your company thousands and thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, depending on the size and the length of the outage. So making sure that everything is bought in pairs is essential. Further to that, making sure that not only do you buy two of everything, but that you've got uh, redundancy built into each of these individual pieces of infrastructure. So if you do buy a server, making sure that the server backend infrastructure is set up in pairs. So you've got not one network card, but two network cards, a network card with multiple points. Uh, making sure that the disks on the server are set up in redundancy, they're set up in particular RAID groups, in pools, making sure that the um, that the server has dual power adapters, power, you know, if one of the powers fail, the other one will pick it up, making sure that the power is split across one power rail and the other power rail or, or across multiple UPSs if you do have that in your server rack. And that also you know, is true of your um, switches, your routers, your firewalls, making sure that they've got dual powers, making sure that they're set up in tandem, making sure that all the links between each of these devices are set up in uh, more than one way. So that if a link from one server to one switch goes down, the server can also access an alternate switch. These switches can talk to each other, that they're connected via core switches. Um, your firewall, you know, making sure that your firewall, which is essentially that centralized point where all of your traffic flows in and out of your network, there's, perhaps there's two of them. Because if that one firewall goes down, you've got a second one to have that link go through. So we are going to be breaking this down into several categories. We're gonna be talking about server, redundancy and high availability. We're going to be talking about networking. We're gonna be talking about storage data centers as well, and comms cabinets, server cabinets, what sort of infrastructure you need in place there. We're also gonna be touching on backups, disaster recovery, and a few other tips and tricks that I would recommend to make sure that your availability is as high as possible all the time. The most important thing is you wanna make sure that all of your infrastructure has been planned for ahead of time. If you are purchasing new equipment, my general recommendation is to buy everything in pairs. 
If you're going to buy a server, look at commissioning two. If you're looking at buying a switch, look at commissioning two. If you want to put in a new link, an internet link, if you have multiple offices and you want to put links between your offices, look at setting two up. So my general recommendation is look at pairs. So whenever you're doing planning, always put redundancy in that planning in your forefront of your mind when you are planning to configure any new infrastructure. If you are setting up a new office, if you're setting up some new comms in a data center, in a comms room, look at the proper planning with redundancy and high availability at the forefront of your mind uh, because you wanna make sure you put that in place first now rather than later on when it may be too late or may cost you more down the track to actually introduce this further redundancy when it's perhaps too late and will require more planning and changes to your network to implement later on. So let's talk about server redundancy, server high availability. You can break these out into two main categories, physical servers and virtual servers. If we're talking about physical servers, every physical server that is purchased, as I mentioned, look at pairing it with two physical servers. If you have a physical server that is gonna be running Windows or Linux, whatever its function may be, if it's going to be a database server, if it's going to be a uh, web server, look at commissioning two. If one fails, the other one can pick it up. So these are things like um, setting up your service perhaps in tandem, setting them up with uh, load balancing in place so that the load can be spread across two, high availability in place so that if one of those servers does go down, all of the operations can fail over to the other one. So if you are purchasing a server and it has a number of hard drives in it, look at purchasing a server that has sufficient hard drives so you can set up multiple levels of RAID, right? So RAID 5, RAID 1, 0, different sorts of RAID configurations that if one disk fails, you don't lose data. So you've got to configure your server based on um, you know, multiple groups of RAID disks. Look at having hot swappables and cold swappable disks available. So you may have an array of disks. For example, you may have eight disks which are set up in a RAID, perhaps two four group disks uh, in RAID 5, so two RAID 5s in, um, you know, made up of four disks, and you may have an additional one or two disks in there, which are your hot spares. They are disks that are there in the event that a disk fails in one of your RAIDs, the other disks can be allocated to that RAID, rebuild the RAID so that you don't lose any data or you actually contain, uh, you continue to have your redundancy in place. Additionally to your hot spares, you may want to look at having cold spares available. They could be disks that are sitting in there dormant. They could be disks that are sitting in a cabinet or in your server room, in your cabinet, just sitting outside of your server so that in the event of a disk failure, even if your hot spares have gone, somebody could physically go to that server and insert new disks and then have those disks rebuild as they need it. It's always important to have some spare disks. The last thing that you want is for your disks to fail uh, multiple disks to fail, and then you have to go and order and procure more disks. So having some disks that are cold spares, essentially um, allocated, you know, predetermined for that particular server, always available is always a good thing to do. Your network card, get two network cards with multiple ports on each of those NICs, right? So that if one physical network card fails, the other network card can pick up the slack and you can still be on the network regardless of if it fails or not. If a physical port or a cable gets disconnected from a physical port on that uh, on one of those NICs, you can still be operational if that NIC has more than one port. So nowadays you can purchase network cards with two, four um, you know, physical network points and configuring, essentially configuring more NICs, more network points across multiple NICs will ensure that you do have high availability. Depending on how you are, you know, how you are setting up your network, if you have multiple VLANs, multiple subnets, have every VLAN, every subnet having at least two network, two network points physically on each NIC. Configuring dual power supplies on each server is one of those elementary things. So if you are, you know, if you are purchasing, procuring a new server, get two power supplies. Most uh, rack-based servers, you know, most rack-based servers, even tower servers will contain dual power supplies, but make sure that whenever you are looking at configuring your servers, they have two, if one fails, the other one will pick it up. 
the other important thing is there's no point in having two dual power, you know, two power supplies for dual power if they're both running into the same power supply, into the same UPS, into the same power rail in a rack, for example, because if that rack goes down or that power board goes down or that UPS goes down, you've lost both of them. So if you do have two power supplies on a server, have one running into one rail, into one UPS, have one running into an, into another rail or another UPS. But if one fails, you've got the other one that can still pick up and you can still have uh, your server running. I think that is very, very important is to make sure that all of your servers are always under warranty. The last thing that you want is for your server to be out of warranty, to be end of life, or to not even be under support with whatever that manufacturer, with, with, you know, with whatever the vendor is, whether if, it be Dell, Lenovo, HP, uh, Cisco. Um, if you don't have that server under warranty, under support, and you have failed parts, right? If you have failed parts, you potentially either lost, you know, functionality to a component of the server, or the server could be down. Um, if you don't have any support, or that server is not under warranty, it's going to be very difficult for you to get those spare parts. So making sure that you do have your server under support and have a good support agreement in place, perhaps with a very quick turnaround time, four hour turnaround time, eight hour turnaround time, 24 hour turnaround time, whatever your SLA may be, so that if you do have parts that do fail, you can go to your vendor, you can go down to a particular vendor that you know gives you the procurement for your parts and you can get those parts as quickly as possible. The last thing you want especially is your server to be out of warranty and end of life even, which is worst case scenario, where you may not even be, be able to get the right parts for your server and then you're gonna be in big trouble if you do require replacement parts for your server. Then once you've installed the operating system, whatever the function of that server is, make sure that the function, the software, the application has redundancy considered, right? Always have redundancy at the back of your mind when you are setting up your server. That could be clustering, for example. So if you are setting up your server, as a SQL server, for example. You may wanna have clustering configured so that if one server goes down, the services of that one server can be pushed or failed over to another server. If you're running virtualization, if you have, for example, something like uh, VMware, you've got ESXi configured on one of those servers, have clustering in mind. So you have one set up with ESXi, you have a secondary server set up with ESXi, both in a cluster, set up with failover, so if one server fails the, in the cluster, the other one can pick up the, uh, the functionality of that um, failed server if it needs to get uh, operational. But always set up your servers in pairs. We talked about looking at buying two of everything. So even though you've got a physical server with multiple levels of redundancy on the hardware perspective, on the server, disks, on the network cards, on the power, etc., etc. Make sure that your configuration of your servers is always across two servers. One fails, the full server fails, the other one can pick up the slack accordingly. In a VMware perspective, in a virtualization, in a hypervisor perspective, you can set up multiple levels of redundancy from high availability to failover across that server. Imperative that you do that, always have that planned and perfected um, as you are configuring those servers. Configuring uh, a, your hypervisor, uh, we're gonna be using VMware as an example. Um, the VMs that are getting built, Again, similar to the physical server perspective, or you could be, you know, you, you build it in pairs, it's always good practice to do that as well in a, in a virtual perspective. Um, there is a lot of human error and things can go wrong from a VM perspective, so always set up your VMs in pairs as well. Um, if you have a web server, build two web servers um, so that, you know, if one fails, the other one can pick it up. We talked about SQL, for example. Um, there's other things like DFS um, for, you know, for file-based uh, replication between sites. Uh, between servers, excuse me. So if one fails, the other one can pick it up or you can have load balancing across your VMs. Um, have your VMs set up with multiple NICs, right? So a physical server has a network card and has physical ports on the NIC. Um, have a VM set up with multiple NICs as well. Um, one going to one physical server, one going to a different physical server, one going to a physical network card, one going to a different network card. Uh, have your VMs talking to different uh, data stores, which is essentially a group of disks uh, configured on a SAN or a NAS or a storage device somewhere on your network. And you have that configured with multiple data stores and connect those multiple data stores or disk pools 
to your uh, VM so that you can have, you know, not all, essentially not putting all of your disks in the one basket. So if one data store goes down or one NAS goes down or one SAN LUN goes down, um, you can, you've got redundancy on a disk level as well. So we've mentioned multiple, um, uh, you know, if you've got SQL, uh, multiple data, you know, multiple servers with clustering from a VM perspective, multiple hypervisors for redundancy in a cluster. Uh, think about, you know, your core infrastructure, such as your domain controllers, your DNS, always very important to have multiple domain controllers on your network. Regardless of your size of your network, your domain controller is used for all of your authentication. Your staff log in, they get authenticated on your network, the computers get authenticated on your network. Your DNS is doing your translation of your IPs to DNS form. Um, so having multiple domain controllers, multiple DNS, ensures that if one of them is affected, the other one can pick it up and carry on. So when you're configuring your DHCP server and it's pushing out your IP addresses, you have multiple DNSs to talk to multiple domain controllers. If your primary is unavailable, your secondary can pick it up and you can continue as normal. This is my overview of your server redundancy. There are other things that we haven't talked about from a server perspective, but making sure that any component on a physical server, on a virtual server, always think about that redundancy, always think about that high availability so that if one of the devices, one of the components fails, the other one can pick it up. So very, very important that you do that. Network redundancy and how you configure your network is extremely important in any business, in any infrastructure configuration that you may have. You've got your server components, making sure that your servers are redundant, making sure that all of that is all redundant. But if your network is poorly set up and your physical connections, your physical infrastructure is poorly set up and not with high availability thought of beforehand, you're gonna have problems as devices or links or you know even worse sites go down, you have to invoke disaster recovery. So making sure that your network is configured with redundancy and high availability is of utmost importance. You start off with your physical infrastructure. We're talking about firewalls, we're talking about switches, we're talking about routers and other network components. Always look at redundancy at the forefront of your mind whenever you are procuring any of these pieces of infrastructure. My general rule is, as we said, we always buy two of everything. So if you are looking at getting a firewall, buy a firewall for your primary, a firewall for your, sec for your secondary. If your primary firewall goes down, your firewall controls all of your, you know, your security coming in and out of your network. If that goes down, you've potentially lost your network. Uh, same deal with your switches. If you've got your core switches, if you've got switches, um, you know that, that all of your computers and your servers and your phones and everything are all running into, if they're all running into one switch and your switch goes down, you've lost access to your network for most of your infrastructure, most of your workstations and your servers in your infrastructure. Further to that, buying two may not be sufficient. You know, you could have all of your devices running across the two of them, but they're still running into potentially into one switch. So I've got one computer running into one switch and a different computer running into a different switch. If that switch still goes down, you've still got problems, for example. So always think about not only procuring them in pairs or in you know groups of multiple uh, switches, but think about how you're gonna design it. Think about how you're gonna design your VLANs across your switches. Have VLANs spread between your switches. Have those switches running into other switches for multiple levels. You know, they're called trunking. So you can trunk your switches together to form multiple networks within your network. So have multiple switches, multiple firewalls procured uh, so that if a physical um, connection goes down, a physical infrastructure piece goes down, you've got another one to pick up the slack. So always have everything set up in pairs. A good example would be a server. If you have a server, a server itself should be procured with one or more network cards with multiple points. I'd have one of those network points at the back of a server running into one switch and the other point running into a different switch. So if one of my switches goes down, the server can still communicate to an alternate switch and then out to my firewall, out to my router, and then out onto my into out to the internet or an alternate site. So always doing everything in pairs is of utmost importance. So your network device should also have two power supplies built in. 
So not only one, so that if one power goes down, you've lost your entire switch or firewall, but have two, one on each side, so that if one goes down, your switch or your firewall can still be operational. If you're in a business, you more than likely have got an internet connection out, um, out of your business, out into the cloud, out into the, into the network, into the internet. Um, your ISP would have procured this for you, your internet service provider. My general recommendation is to always have at least two internet connections. One is your primary and one is a secondary. You could have them both active-active, or you could have one active and the other one passive, and you're sitting there passively. The reason for this is if your primary internet connection goes down, you can switch over to a second one. It's always important to have one there set up as redundancy in case the primary one does go down for whatever reason. That could be your router going down, your, you know, your router that's been provided by your ISP. If your ISP goes down, look at perhaps your second link being with a different carrier. So you can have what's called carrier diversity. So you don't have both internet links running out to the same service provider. You have one going to one service provider, one going out into a second service provider. If we're talking about links, we're also talking about potentially links going out to different services, going out to different sites, into different offices, into perhaps into customer locations. Uh, looking at setting everything up with two links at least. If I've got site A as my head office, as my core office, and then I've got site B, which could be a remote office, have the link between site A and site B set up with two connections. Again, they don't have to both be active-active. You can have one as your primary link, which is a faster bandwidth, faster performance, and have a secondary link set up as a failover. So that if your primary link does go down, you've got a secondary link there to back it up. Because the worst thing that you want to happen is that one of those links goes down. If you have a single, single link, uh, that link goes down, you could potentially lose access to that office. That secondary link could be set up in a multiple you know, set of ways. You can have a VPN connection, you can have a direct connection, you could be going via an MPLS, whatever that may be, but making sure that you've at least got two redundant links between all of your sites. If you've got connection into particular cloud services um, out, outside of your internet, for example, perhaps to a backup service out on the cloud, perhaps to a cloud-based infrastructure such as AWS or Azure, have two links. Your primary goes down, your secondary can kick in and still be operational. Apart from all of this, you've got all your physical connections, your physical infrastructure in place, your physical links, dual links all in place, everything's all redundant. Make sure that the routing protocols that you decide to use between all of your connections uh, is the correct routing protocol to use. Things such as EIGRP, uh, RIP, um, BGP, whatever their connection will be, each of these protocols will have different uh, redundancy built in, will have different smarts built in on the background to understand how your network is functioning, understand your different IP addresses, your different routes, how everything's sort of functioning through your network. So it's very important to think about how you're going to architect your network between sites so that you do have redundancy and high availability thought out and um, planned before you actually configure your network. Think about perhaps your routers as well. We mentioned um, you know, having dual internet connections, dual links between your sites. Nowadays, there are a lot of routers that can also incorporate two connections built into the one router. Perhaps one connection is a physical ethernet NIC connection, right, going out to a particular service, and the other one could be connected to a 4G service. Could, you know, a router could have a 4G SIM built into the actual unit, but if the primary goes down, you can still connect to a service over a 4G. So you can actually now have redundancy built into the actual single unit also. Let's talk about storage redundancy. Apart from redundancy such as your server redundancy, making sure that your servers are uh, configured correctly with redundancy, they have multiple components inside that have redundancy built in, that your software is configured with redundancy, uh, you also need to ensure that your network is set up with redundancy such as your multiple devices, multiple links in place. The other important thing is your storage infrastructure, making sure that whatever storage is utilized, whatever storage is procured, that it has redundancy and high availability thought about beforehand when you are procuring that infrastructure. Buying your storage in pairs. Now this is a big thing that a lot of places may not be able to afford because it does, make, it does essentially mean that if you are gonna buy a SAN, you buy two. If you're gonna buy a NAS, you buy two. 
um, sometimes in multiple sites, sometimes in the same site. Now, sometimes that's not always possible because it is a cost-effective thing, but always making sure that, you know, if your primary SAN or your primary NAS does go down, you do have another one to, to essentially have those services come up without any loss of data or operations. Whatever storage device you purchase, make sure that you are purchasing one that has multiple levels of redundancy built in. Something that is um, business grade uh, devices, right? So a lot of places may purchase a small, cheap SAN or a cheap NAS that is insufficient for a business, right? So a home NAS may not have the right, you know, may only have one network point and may not have multiple levels of power, those sort of things, so that if one of those fails, you've lost production. So buy one that has multiple levels of physical redundancy, one that has multiple power supplies, two power supplies at a minimum. So if one power supply does go down, the other one can still be powered and still be operational. Built into your storage device, whether that be a SAN or a NAS, have more than one port. Preferably have more than one port spread across more than one card. If a physical port goes down, another physical port can be used. Obviously, they will need to be configured for failover and redundancy. They could be set up as active-active so that all data is passing through all of your connections. Or, or some can be set up as passive so that if one of those points fails, the other one can pick it up and you can continue as normal. The most storage devices, most NASs or SANs, will have a storage processor, which is essentially the smarts, the brains behind the actual storage device itself. It'll have your CPU, your RAM, those sort of things. So purchasing a, a device that has two storage processors, storage processor A, storage processor B, each with their own interfaces. So that if one storage processor goes down, another one can pick it up and you can continue. You have one storage processor. If you have any of those components go down, you lose your SAN, you lose your NAS always have two. But making sure that these are also set up to automatically fail over. The last thing that you want is you have all this awesome infrastructure set up, you've got all this redundancy in place, but then if one of them fails, you have to manually go in and switch it over, right? And switch it over, doing it manually sometimes isn't viable if it was to happen in the middle of the night, if it happens at a time where people or staff are not available to do the cutover. So having it so that it does it automatically, automatic failover is imperative. Further to that, making sure that however you've configured your LUNs, your storage pools and your groups of disks and your LUNs, that they are split across your storage processors. So it's nice to have storage processor A and storage processor B, but making sure that you've got LUNs spread across the two for load balancing. You don't want all of the load resting on just one single storage processor. And as we said before, is having that process in place where if a LUN is running on your A, that if it does fail, it does cut over to your B automatically without any failure to any of your services. Think about how you're gonna configure the SAN or the NAS. The whole point of this device is it is a pool of disks. So you're gonna have multiple disks, however many disks you may have. Think about how they're gonna be configured. You don't wanna configure all of your disks on their own so that if a disk fails, you'll lose data. So think about things such as your RAID configuration. How are you going to architect your RAID? Are you gonna have multiple pools of disks set up in multiple different types of RAID groups? You know, you've got RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, RAID 6, RAID 10, different RAID groups, different pools, grouping the disks together in pools with data spread across, load balanced across these pools but if you do have one or multiple disks fail, if you have pools fail, you've got multiple levels of redundancy from a disk, from a data perspective. Following from that is how you're going to share and provision those pools or those LUNs, right? LUNs on a SAN, um, SAN perspective out to your workforce. So for example, if we're talking about a pool configured with a LUN that's shared out to a hypervisor, such as a VMware ESXi host, you wanna make sure that you have multiple paths to a host or to multiple hosts. The last thing that you want is for one of these LUNs to have one path, you know, you can have paths configured over iSCSI or fiber channel connectivity. Fiber channel is a little bit more complex requiring fiber switches, which in turn would, you know, would we'd require multiple links, multiple fiber switches as well. Um, but make sure that these, these zones, these paths are set up in pairs, are set up with multiple levels of redundancy one of the paths to your ESXi host fails, you've got another one running, right? So each LUN, each storage uh, pool configured to go multiple ways 
multiple ways around your path um, so that if one fails, another one can pick it up and you don't have any redundancy or any failure. Talked about looking at getting everything in pairs, getting one SAN, better to get two. Getting one NAS, better to get two. Uh, additionally to that is looking at um, uh, SAN replication or NAS replication. So this may mean looking at, you know, we've mentioned getting two NASs, getting one NAS or SAN set up in one place and a SAN set up in another. And a good example of this could be across multiple sites. If I've got site A with a SAN with 100 terabytes of capacity and I've got a SAN set up in site B also with 100 terabytes of capacity, setting up SAN replication across the two. There are tools in place to actually replicate all of your LUNs automatically from one to another. It's ongoing replication, continuous data protection. CDP is one of these te terms that you may have heard. So that all of your data is continually replicated between the two. So that in the event of a disaster, in the event of your SAN going down, services can automatically flick over right to your site B, they can become active. And then all you have to do is just repoint all of your infrastructure, your servers, your switches, your, you know, your firewalls to just talk to this secondary SAN if need be. This also forms part of your disaster recovery in the event where your primary site A goes down, everything can be restored from site B, or you could potentially run temporarily with site B on that SAN on site B as well. There are tools on top of that that you can set up, for example, for your virtualization, for your Hyper-Vs, for your VMwares, where you can actually have your VMs replicated from SAN A to SAN B. Um, so you've got your SAN replication and then you've got a tool such as, if I use an example such as VMware's SRM, that actually replicates your VMs across. It utilizes the SAN replication technology, but then goes down to a granular level and does and manages the VMs that are being moved between one and, the, one and the other SANs as well. So that in the event of a disaster, you can just pull up individual VMs, reconfigure them, bring them back if need be. How about your comms rooms, your racks, your data centers themselves? So these are the locations where you're actually storing all of your infrastructure. It sounds wonderful if you've got all of your servers, all of your switches, um, all of your storage, everything all set up in pairs. It's all racked into the one location. There's one server room or in one data center, um, one rack, for example, and then your whole rack goes down. It doesn't matter how many servers or switches you've got if you've lost it all, right? So setting up and configuring, architecting your uh, server rooms, your comms cabinets, your data center racks, and your actual even your data centers with redundancy in mind is imperative. Making sure that when you design your rack, that you've got left and right power, that your left and right power are going to different phases. You may have different phases, multiple phases, Electric, like from this is from an electricity point of view, coming into a building, you don't want to put all of your um, devices into one phase, into phase one, because if that phase has an issue and you've got a power outage, you've lost everything. And then likewise, they will run into, as we said, into a UPS and into a generator, into multiple UPSs, multiple generators that give you enough power so that you do have uh, everything redundant and high available as long as possible could have enterprise grade UPSs that last for a long time, generators that you can continually just continue to pump gas and petrol into it so that it continues to be, you know, continues to operate in the event of anything failing. And then if you want to think even bigger is having, um, perhaps if you're in a data center perspective, not having all of your um, cabinets next to each other. Sometimes this may be ineffective. You know, you may want to have all of your cabinets next to each other because that's, that's your rack but some places that I've seen have their racks in different locations in the data center so that if one particular section of that data center is affected, it doesn't affect everything at once. It could only affect a portion of your infrastructure. But really, if we want to do this properly, you want to look at alternate data centers. You want to look at a co-location site, a DR site, a site that is perhaps active-active, you know, between two data centers or an active-passive setup where one data center is live and the other, uh, the other data center is passive, waiting to be activated. So this could be a uh, geographical consideration where you have one data center in one geographical location and then one that is perhaps 50, 100, miles or kilometers away so that if it, you know if there's a disaster it impacts your entire 
geo you know, the geography of where you're at in the CBD in the city area, um, you're not going to have a huge impact if everything fails over to a secondary data center. So having services in place across two data centers, perhaps as I said in an active active where things are shared between the two, active passive where everything is hosted in one, but in the event of a disaster, whatever that may be, everything fails over, fails over to the second, your IPs get updated, your servers get updated, everything gets updated so that everything is still operational uh, is also something to consider. That it obviously will incur a much higher cost to have a data center replication, um, co-location site, but I tell you what, if your whole data center goes down, it doesn't matter how much redundancy you've got in place, how many switches, how good your virtualization um, architecture has been designed. If your data center goes down, your comms room, your server room goes down, and you don't have an alternate site, it really doesn't mean much. But this is making sure that all of your systems, all of your core infrastructure, your core servers, your core business data is backed up regularly. Daily backups, incremental backups, full backups weekly, for example, full backups monthly, annual backups um, that are getting backed up to multiple locations on premise, perhaps going from one server, getting backed up to a, a SAN or a NAS or a disk based um, on premise um, backup solution that could then in turn be backed up onto tape media, onto LTO tape media daily, weekly, that is then turned sent off site to a third party company that manages the storage of this media, catalogs your media based on, da on, on barcodes from a tape perspective. You can then restore that data if you do have an event. Um, you can also have a SAN or NAS replication where you've got the backups running onto a NAS and then that NAS is then replicated to another NAS or another, NAS or another SAN somewhere else. Um, you can also have backups running out onto the cloud as well. So you've got really disk based, you've got tape based, and you've got cloud based backups as well. Making sure that you test this stuff regularly, making sure that not only do you have in place backups, but that you can actually restore the backups as well. I guess along with this is then not necessarily directly related to high availability and redundancy, but making sure that those backups are um, have the adequate retention required. So for certain legal documentation, financial documentation, making sure that that data is recoverable after a certain amount of time, whether that be one, seven, 10 years or infinite, for example. If we're talking about disaster recovery, it's very imperative that you do have a disaster recovery plan in place. It's called a DRP. Essentially, this contains a whole bunch of information that details what do we do in the event of a disaster. It'll detail exactly how your infrastructure is configured. So when you're designing your DRP, specifying there how your systems are configured, how is your high availability, how is your um, recovery in the event of a disaster, who gets involved in the event of a disaster, and how do we restore services in the quickest, most efficient way. The DRP you know, works hand in hand with what's called a BCP, a business continuity plan. And this is a plan that is necessarily not IT related, but details, you know, what, what does HR do? What do marketing do? What do finance do? What do these departments do in the event of a disaster? How do we meet? And the BCP and the DRP, you know, inter interrelate with each other. They talk to each other and really outlines what do we do holistically as a company in the event of a disaster to restore everything. The most important thing is that you wanna be testing everything that we've talked about. There's no point in having an amazing, high available system, having redundancy everywhere, all your switches, your VMware infrastructure, everything's replicated, you've got site to site, uh, replication of your storage, you've got a disaster recovery plan in place, you've got everything outlined beautifully, uh, things are going up to the cloud, you've got tape backups. There's no point in having all of this unless you actually know that it works. Um, knowing that it works could make or break your business because I'll tell you what, in the event of a disaster, you don't want to be betting your money that everything is going to work 100% of the time and that you can actually restore everything to how it was and that everything, that anything will even run in the event of a disaster or anything going down. So putting things in place that allows you to do regular testing of this infrastructure is imperative. A lot of companies do an annual DR test or a biannual DR test where they test everything, um, putting, you know, things in place where you can occasionally from time to time 
power down a server, power down a switch, power down a firewall. Make sure that things are operational. You could bring off a disk, you can just go to your SAN, you can go to your server and just pull a hard drive out and be confident that there'll be no data loss. So putting these plans in place, making sure that you test it um, is imperative because if you don't test it and things go pear-shaped, really is pointless, right? So really you do have to design and plan your high availability and your redundancy. Plan it ahead of time and please, please, please do it properly. There are way too many companies out there that want to cut corners for the cost sake, right? They want to just put in the minimal amount of um, not only effort, but the minimal amount of money just to get the operations running without considering the, uh, the inevitable, right? Inevitably, devices are going to fail. This is hardware, this is technology, these are you know, moving parts that will eventually fail at some point. So it's best to invest the time, invest the, the, the right architecture, uh, architecture and design and the money required to put the right things in place now because down the track, uh, you don't know what could happen. At the end of the day, it is like an insurance policy, right? Um, not everybody wants to get home insurance or car insurance, but when you do have an accident, when something does go wrong, boy, are you happy that you do have it. Um, so making sure that you don't cut corners when you are designing your IT, put in the right high availability and redundant systems, and you'll be right as rain. I hope you found this video helpful. I really hope that you did learn something, that it was something useful that you can put uh, into practice and give you some tips when you are designing your IT in your business. Um, love it if you commented, give me a thumbs up and uh, we'll talk to you next time. So if you found that video helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel Digital by Computing just on the button there for more videos.